Okay, that's it. It's time for a road trip. In this Four Corners, The Road Less Traveled episode from our Farmington, New Mexico base, we're going to visit ancient civilizations. Humans have lived in the Four Corners San Juan Basin for at least 12,000 years. There are hundreds of pre-Columbian sites throughout the area. In 700 AD, they started building cliff dwellings in Mesa Verde, and it became the cultural center of the area. In the 900s, the cultural center of the area moved to Chaco Canyon. Farmington is right between them. And since this series is called The Road Less Traveled, I'm going to take you to Chaco and other places you've probably never been or even heard of. We'll see the great houses of Chaco Canyon, the largest pre-Columbian stone settlement north of Mexico, until it was abandoned in the late 1200s. Then we'll take a quick visit to a place with the highest density of archaeological sites in America. It's called Canyons of the Ancients. Then we'll see the work of the best ancient stonemasons in North America at Hovenweep National Monument. While these civilizations were thriving, there was an even bigger society in North America, and I'm going to take you there, too, even though it's not in the West. It's in Illinois. They were the Mississippian Mound Builders, and their largest settlement was called Cahokia. Chaco Cultural National Monument is about 90 minutes southeast of Farmington, or a two-and-a-half-hour drive northwest of Albuquerque. Today, Chaco is very remote, but from the years 850 to 1250, it was the cultural center of the ancestral Pueblo peoples. They built roads to other communities and traded with people as far away as Mexico. They had the engineering and organizational skills to build massive stone complexes that were the largest buildings in North America for over 600 years. But by the end of the 1200s, they abandoned their great buildings and dispersed throughout the region. And nobody really knows why. Those of you who regularly watch this channel know that I try to impart a bit of knowledge as well as travel info about each of the locations we visit. That's going to be a bit tricky this time because there is much that is unknown about this place and Chacoan culture in general. They had no written language and left only a few petroglyphs. Most of the sites have been excavated by competent archaeologists, but some have not. But this unknowing is part of the fun. As you explore, you can't help but ask yourself questions. Why did they build in such a harsh place? Was the climate less harsh a thousand years ago? If so, why did it change? And how did they cut so much stone without metal tools? And how did they get the spare time to organize and build multi-story buildings that require building materials from far away? And what were these buildings used for? Many people have ideas, some based on oral traditions of tribes descended from these people, and others based on artifacts, but nobody really knows. There are many clues, but few definitive answers. Nobody even knows why this place is called Chaco. In 1774, it appeared on a Spanish map as Chaca, but we don't know why. The houses all have names, which were suggested by Mexican guides, of an 1849 U.S. military survey mission. But we only have guesses about their meanings. There are few places that are this mysterious, and that makes it interesting. About 150 Chacoan sites are scattered throughout the San Juan Basin. Chaco Canyon contains the highest concentration and the biggest of these sites. To get there, your mapping app may give you several options. But take my word for it. Take the northern route. It has only 12 miles of gravel road. If it's been raining, even this road may not be passable. It's best to call the visitor center before you head out. Once I got here by using the southern route. And boy, was that a mistake. It is poorly maintained and washboarded for most of the 33 graveled miles. I'll never take that route again. Again, don't trust your GPS map system. It may send you on roads that are even worse, especially if you're trying to take a shortcut from Bistai. Trust me, take this northern route. And this drive really isn't that bad. Here the gravel is well graded, and there's only a few sandy spots and a low washes that might wash out in a rain. Less than 40,000 people make it to the visitor center each year. It's here where you pay the $25 vehicle entrance fee. It has a few exhibits, and it's the only place in the park with drinking water. The 49-site campground has no potable water or hookups. So to camp here, you must be prepared. The closest place to buy provisions and gas is about 21 miles outside the park. Many remote parks take advantage of the dark sky, and Chaco does it the best. They do this to carry on a tradition. 
The Chacoan people used knowledge of the movement of the sun and the 18.6-year lunar cycle to help them determine when to plant crops. They had their own little observatory. They carefully placed stone slabs near the top of the butte I can't pronounce. They placed the slabs in such a way that the sun would hit a spiral petroglyph on a certain day of the year. Archaeologists call this a sun dagger. There's other evidence that they watched the sky in the form of rock art. Many think that this rock art represents the supernova of July 1054. Since 1991, the Park Service has carried on the stargazing tradition with its night sky program. It has several telescopes and an observatory with a telescope with a 25-inch mirror. That's a big telescope. And as you can see, it's capable of capturing amazing images. Before we walk the ruins, you need to know what a kiva is, because there's a lot of them and they played an important role here. Kivas are stone-walled pits believed to be used for ceremonies. They are typically 3 to 4 feet deep and about 12 to 17 feet in diameter. Great houses have many of these. The great houses also had at least one great kiva. These were much deeper and bigger, often with bench seating around the edge, and most had a subterranean vault to represent the underworld, and they were covered with a roof with a small opening to represent the sky. Now it's time to start exploring. Uh, by the way, the elevation is about 6,200 feet here, and your cell phone probably won't work. There are a few hiking trails here, including one to an overlook on top of the canyon. But you'll get to most of the sites via the park's 8-mile-plus loop road. The first site built is also the first site we'll visit. It's called Una Vida. A one-mile loop walking trail gets you there. Construction here started in about the year 860. It was near two creeks and washes, so they had convenient access to water. If you make it out here, don't forget to walk to the end of the trail. There's a collection of petroglyphs on the cliff face. No one knows what they mean, if anything. They could be just adolescent doodles. The first great house on the loop road is Hungo Pavi, which might be a Spanish translation of Hopi, meaning crooked nose Pueblo. A quarter mile loop path takes you around it. Like the other great houses, they think it was a public building with a small resident population. Apparently today, it looks pretty much as it did when the U.S. military stumbled upon the site in 1849. The site has never been excavated. As I round the corner, you'll notice how well the stones are cut and how little mortar they used. They cut the sandstone without any metal tools from the nearby cliffs. And they carry them all here in baskets that they made. Every once in a while, there's a log poking out from a wall. They used logs to build ceilings and floors. This large timber is basically a floor joist. Logs like this were very helpful to archaeologists as well. They helped determine when the buildings were constructed based on tree ring and carbon dating methods. More recently, radioisotope tests were used to find out where the trees grew. It turns out that the bigger logs grew in the Chuxa and San Mateo Mountains, which are 60 to 70 miles away, and they didn't have horses back then. The Spanish didn't bring them until the 1500s. They didn't have the wheel either, so they had to carry them, and they were about 15 feet long and weighed 600 pounds, and thousands of logs were needed for each building. Think about how much effort is required for the few thousand people who lived here to carry thousands of logs 60 to 70 miles. And as we continue our walk, you'll notice that most of the logs are gone. Notice how thick the walls are, and they had to be, to support the multiple stories. Some of these room blocks were up to four stories tall. At first, I was a bit disappointed to see mortar on top of these walls. But then I learned that they're doing it because they have to protect the walls. It's called capping. Here you can see that the core of the wall was filled with loose stones of various sizes. Only the facing stones are smooth. As you walk around the backside and start the return leg, it's hard to imagine that there were once 160 rooms here, and you can't even make out the plaza. And this old sketch provides a clue, but it's, it's still hard to make out when you're here. As you're walking around, you can't help but notice piles of stone and sand. And because this site has never been excavated, no one knows what relics may lie beneath. When I get back, we're going to visit the great house that was the largest building in North America for over 600 years. Dozens of hours go into these things, so please watch the ads. A little further down the loop road is the parking area for the largest, most excavated, and most famous great house in the canyon, Pueblo Benito. It shares a parking lot with Chetro Kettle, the second biggest great house in terms of number of rooms. 
Its classic D-shape covers more surface area than any other great house. It's even bigger than Pueblo Benito in that sense. But since it's over a third of a mile away, it gets far fewer visitors than its more famous neighbor. And I didn't go there either. You know, to avoid ruin fatigue. Pueblo Benito is downtown Chaco. Its construction started in about the year 850, and it's big. But it's hard to see just how big. There's a drawing on the info sign, and it really must have been something back in the day. They've counted over 600 rooms. It had at least four stories, and it is the most widely studied in the canyon. It has the classic D layout with 32 kivas, three great kivas, and a large plaza. This is the east wall of the block of rooms. There is still great debate about how these rooms were used. Some think they were living quarters for extended families. But when they were excavated, they found little evidence of domestic activities. So some think the great houses had religious, political, or economic functions. Or perhaps all three. Again, most of the large timbers have been removed. During the excavation, they had to remove over 600 years of windblown dirt and collapsed debris. But it was worth it. Over 15,000 artifacts were found. Some were from as far away as Mexico. They found baskets, pottery, and stones to grind grain. And they also found a few surprise luxury goods, including what some say is a copper bell. And they found several of macaw skulls. Yes, macaw, the bird. And they live about a thousand miles to the south. And some of these skulls have been carbon dated to before the year 900. So they've been trading for a long time. Well, back on the trail, you can't help but notice the large boulders. Many of them have crushed the rooms. The Chacoans built their biggest houses near the north wall of the cliff to possibly block out the cold north wind. It does get cold up here. But this cliff had a problem. Pueblo Benito was built under a 97-foot tall, 30,000-ton block of stone that was not attached to the surrounding stone. At some point, the Chacoans knew that it might fall, so their engineers built a retaining wall to prevent it from falling on their greatest building. For eight to 900 years, it worked. But in 1941, it fell and destroyed many of the rooms. As I walk around the site, look at the background, toward the cliff face. You'll see more of these huge rocks resting where they fell. By the way, at the end of the trail, there's another trail that leads to some petroglyphs along the cliff. The main trail goes between and over the rubble from the fallen slab to a viewpoint with one of the best views in the canyon. You can see just how many of the rooms have been crushed. But if you look closely, you can still see how the interior rooms were designed to add strength for additional stories. And the longer rooms might even have been access hallways. These guys were thinking. But less than 100 rooms are visible. Where are the other 500? Well, we're standing on some of them, and many surround the sides of the plaza. As you can see from this aerial shot, there's much that we cannot see. If drones were allowed in the park, I would have flown mine to give you a better look, but, but drones are not allowed in federal parks. And it turns out that there is a trail that leads to an overlook of Pueblo Benito. It's only two miles long, with only 200 feet of elevation gain. Unfortunately, I didn't know it existed until after I had finished the shoot, so I didn't get to do it. Next time, I will. While walking around the south path, I noticed an entrance to the rooms. The Park Service created a route through several of the rooms. This was my favorite part of the whole trip. The doorways are all low, and no, they weren't that short. The average man was about 5'5". The doors were shorter to make the walls stronger, and perhaps to keep the heat in. The rooms are well constructed, with windows, and even a few design elements. The logs and ceilings are gone, but you can see how they were made. The larger holes were for supporting rafters, and the smaller holes were for the equivalent of floorboards. I found a few photos from the 1890s and 1920s that show some of the ceilings still in place. After 700 years, they look pretty good. In one photo, it looks like they used reeds to smooth the top layer of the floor. This photo shows a floor from above, after it collapsed. And no, I don't know why the remaining ceilings and floors are no longer here. It's just another Chaco mystery. Four stories in 600 rooms require a lot of logs. They say over 200,000 trees were needed for each great house. And no, I don't know how many of these big ones came from far away. But I've read that a healthy forest has about 40 to 50 trees per acre. 
so they would have had to deforest a minimum of four to 5,000 acres of trees per great house. Then they would have to carry the trees 60 to 70 miles to build just one great house. In this arid climate that only gets about nine inches of rain per year, probably much more land was needed. So they had to clear vast amounts of land to build these buildings. That's an amazing amount of work for the several thousand Chacoans who lived here. By the way, many people think that deforestation is the reason for the Chacoan culture collapse. But in 2014, the University of New Mexico did a study and they found that not to be the case. Not all of the trees had to be carried from 60 to 70 miles away. Pack rat nests, yes, pack rats, turn out to be great time capsules. The rats go around picking up seeds and pieces of material and, well, well, they urinate on them to create their nest. And this hardens and is preserved for very long periods of time. And scientists go around collecting these things. They can be used to not only date the nest, but they can then determine what was growing in the area. And the pack rat nests here show that there were ponderosa pines and other trees growing nearby. But for some reason, they still went 60 to 70 miles away to get the best ones. Could be a form of quality control. Today, all of the walls are bare stone, except for this little area. This shows that the walls were once covered with a smooth plaster layer. And this old photo suggests that many of the walls were entirely plastered. Apparently, they wanted the rooms to look nice. But this is the only piece of plaster I found in the rooms, and frankly, I didn't even notice it until I got back and looked at the photograph. So when you're here, check it out. Another mystery is why most of the rooms do not have fireplaces. It gets cold here, and if the 600 rooms were living quarters, you would expect more of them to have fireplaces for heat and cooking, but only about 60 of the 600 do. And again, another mystery. Anyway, as you walk through the rooms, look up. And you can see just how thick the walls are. And look at that corner window. Kind of a nice touch. And somehow they built all of this without any written instructions. Somebody just had to tell somebody else what to do, and then they did it. That shows that they had to have an organization. They had to have foremans. They had to have laborers. This was a complex society. The room tour ends, or more likely starts, near the Great Kiva and the plaza. I wasn't quite expecting this, and it is, it's quite, I don't want to say shocking, but it, you, you have to really take it all in. The Great Kiva is deep. They might have been able to stand up in them. And the plaza is big. Walking around, it's easy to imagine what this place was like. I'm walking where they did. Perhaps even on the same spot where those macaws were traded. More recent analysis of the pottery shows that some of it contained cacao or cocoa, chocolate. Cacao was grown about 1,200 miles to the south, where it was made into a drink. So that must have been traded in the plaza also. And how did the people there know to walk 1,200 miles up here to do the trading? It's a mystery. This is not a place I wanted to leave right away. It's a place where you just kind of wander and walk around. There's something, always something to see. And again, if you look in the back, you can see some of the huge stones that crushed many of the rooms. Chaco was the center of a culture that included 150 settlements. They built roads to many of them, and many of the 15 to 40 foot wide roads are still detectable. And by the way, the Chacoans actually built staircases into the cliff faces to get to the top of the mesas. And from there, there are some roads leading to other settlements. To many, these structures all look alike. There's actually a name for it called Ruin Fatigue. So I'm going to show you just one more of the great houses before we head to Canyons of the Ancients. This is Pueblo de Arroyo. It's unique because it wasn't built near the North Cliff Face. And this ended up being a problem, as it was adversely affected by floodwaters from the nearby wash. There are 300 rooms here and some nice kivas. Some of them look like they have individual seats, but more than likely they're uh, posts to hold the roof up. Notice the worker on the top of the wall? This is one of the park staff working to preserve the structures. Many of the people who do this work are carrying on a family tradition. Some of their grandparents did this as well. I could go on and on about this mysterious place, but it's time to move on. And besides, I'll be back. I'll be right back after trying to recoup some of the expense of making this. Now that I've shown you the largest stone structures in North America, I'm going to show you where the best pre-Columbian masonry work was done, and we're going to get there by driving through the huge and archaeologically rich 
Canyons of the Ancients National Monument. From our base in Farmington, New Mexico, the drive is only a little over two hours. Canyons of the Ancients covers 175,000 acres in southwest Colorado. It's managed by the Bureau of Land Management, not the park system. So this land can be privately owned and used for commercial purposes. Its main purpose is to protect the highest concentration of archaeological sites in the nation. When driving through it, well, this is pretty much what it looks like. There's no hint that there are over 6,300 individual smallish archaeological sites here. Most of them are unprotected by BLM staff, so they don't really want everyone to know where the sites are. And many can only be accessed from private property. There's an online map, but I didn't find this very helpful. There is a visitor center, and if you really want to go to these remote places, go there and ask how to get there. Access to the bigger, more well-known sites, such as Lowry Pueblo, is quite easy. One of the other popular sites is called Painted Hand Pueblo, and I drove past a small sign on the road that pointed to it. It was definitely on the road less traveled, and I didn't stop. And by the way, most of the area is again over 6,000 feet, and all visitors are instructed to follow leave-no-trace procedures. If you don't know what that means, don't go. Now we're going to continue to Hovenweep National Monument. It's in a wild and remote southwestern corner of Utah. In Paiute, it means deserted valley. Even the ranger behind the counter says she works in the middle of nowhere. I saw few cars on the two-lane road for the past hour or so, but I got there from Mexican Hat. The website is also proud to let you know that all roads to Hovenweep's Visitor Center are paved. Like Canyon of the Ancients, Hovenweep is made up of several small sites. In this case, five or six, depending on which brochure you read. The Visitor Center is located at the largest, called the Square Tower Group. The other units are 10 or so miles away. For a place in the middle of nowhere, the parking lot was surprisingly full. It has a 31-site campground, but very limited services. And the website says flat out, visitors should be self-reliant. After reading a few of the exhibits, it becomes clear that this is another place where there are more questions than answers. What is known is that the area was settled starting around the year 900 AD, but most of the buildings were constructed between 1230 and 1270, which is about the same time the Chacoan population was in decline and people were migrating away. Coincidence? Nah, who knows? There's a paved trail through some scrubland and cryptobacteria, which is a delicate soil creator. Just one step can kill it. So the rules are, stay on the trail. The pavement ends when it meets the two-mile loop trail around Little Ruin Canyon. It's like a mini version of Mesa Verde, with stone lookout towers all around. Around this time, canyons became popular spots to settle because they tended to have more consistent water sources. Remember, the area was in drought. But when it rains near a canyon, the water seeps through the porous sandstone until it hits a non-porous shale layer. Then it flows out into the canyon. When water and other resources are scarce, they must be defended. That might explain why the towers were built on a cliff edge. I was warned not to go left at this point because rattlesnakes were using the trail. So I went to the right. It meanders past square and circular towers, D-shaped dwellings, and kivas. Even on the dirt trail, you have to stay between the rocks. So you can't walk in the ruins here. The trail has many small steps, and the slick rock can be slick, especially when there's a thin layer of sand on top. Now, I've lived in Texas for 30 years, but I've never seen a rattlesnake. And maybe I spent too much time looking down instead of looking at the ruins. There are many of them, and there doesn't seem to be any overall plan. Some are on places that would make good lookouts, though. The masonry here has been called the most skillfully made in pre-Columbian times. Here there is great attention to detail. The stones used are much bigger and thicker than the ones at Chaco, and they use much more mortar. Their skill allowed them to build on oddly shaped surfaces, like this one, and it's been standing upright for 700 years. If you're looking for a longer hike, there's an 8-mile round-trip hike from this area to the Holly unit. You'll have to drive to get to the other Hovenweep units. Some of them require high-clearance vehicles, and they may not be passable after bad weather. They recommend checking with the visitor center before heading to the other units. Well, so far in this episode, we've seen lots of stonework from highly skilled people in the southwest high desert. 
They organized and worked together to create a civilization that lasted for over 300 years. But like other great civilizations, their society broke down and disappeared. If they hadn't been builders and makers, they could never have been rediscovered. So of course you're wondering, where did they go? Well, it turns out that isn't too much of a mystery. They simply dispersed or assimilated into 20 or so other tribes. Next, we're going to visit a place that was thriving at about the same time. They may even have known about each other. But these people didn't build with stone. Not far from the Mississippi River, in the shadows of St. Louis's famous arch, lie the remains of the largest prehistoric civilization north of Mexico. It peaked when the Chacoans did, from 1100 to 1200 A.D. And it had many more residents, 10 to 20,000. They became successful because, like all great societies, they had the ability to grow surplus food. Since they didn't have to spend each day tending to crops or hunting, they had the time to build. They had little stone, but they did have plenty of fertile soil and timber, so they built practical homes and monumental public works. They were mound builders. They built about 120 of them. 70 of them are on the grounds of the 2,200-acre Cahokia State Park in Illinois. They were part of the Mississippian culture. This was their capital. By 1250, it was one of the largest cities in the world, even bigger than London was at the time. But like Chaco, by the 1300s, the city was abandoned. And no one knows why. We don't really even know what these people called themselves. Cahokia is a name taken from a group of natives who lived on the site in the early 1600s. We also don't know why there are so many mounds. Some of them seem to be for burials of important people. Others are not. But near one, 300 bodies were found. Most were young females. And they may have been sacrificed. The biggest mound is 100 feet high and required 15 million 50-pound baskets of soil. And it was built in stages. And the earth came from a nearby pit. It's believed that a chief lived up here in a wood and straw house where he could see all of his subjects. Near the mound is a small reconstruction of a stockade that once ran for two miles around the central plaza. It had evenly placed bastions for archers, though there was no evidence of any major conflict ever occurring here. The stockade required 15 to 20,000 oak and hickory logs. Each were a foot in diameter and 20 feet long. Its remains weren't even discovered until 1966 but since then they've learned that the stockade was rebuilt three times in 200 years. Trees grew nearby, so while this was a massive undertaking, at least they didn't have to haul the logs 60 to 70 miles like the Chacoans did. Farmers need to know when they need to plant. So to help them determine this, these people built hinges. You've all heard of Stonehenge. Well, this is a wood hinge. They built at least five of them. All have different sizes and had a different number of poles. And they don't need anywhere near this many poles to tell the seasons, so this may also have been a place of ceremony. Cahokia has a very fine visitor center slash museum. This was my third visit, and one recent addition is this dugout canoe. Now, the river wasn't the only source of water nearby. There was also a lake, and there were swampy wetlands. Along one wall, there's a life-size diorama of how the wetlands were used for hunting and gathering. Other exhibits show what they made with what materials they had. Of course, they had reeds and wood and rocks, and they had local shells. But more interestingly, they also had seashells from the Gulf of Mexico. So here's more proof of the existence of traders traveling on foot for great distances. There's another exhibit about how the culture was organized, what sort of tools they used to grow and make food. Of course, they made pots and other useful items. You can also learn about the burial of an important man. My favorite part of the museum is the village recreation. It's quite lifelike, informative, and generally impressive. It's too bad the other national monuments don't have displays this nice. One exhibit even shows how experts excavate the site. The last exhibit asks the unanswerable question. What do you think happened? I like that. The park's grounds are also set up for visitors. There are paths to walk among the mounds. On the weekends, it's quite a popular spot for local hikers and joggers. I gotta say, I like this place. If there's enough interest, I would gladly produce a more detailed video on this location. 
Isn't it interesting how civilizations can rise and fall over a thousand miles apart at the very same time in history? They likely had very little contact, if any. Yet their timelines are remarkably similar, as is the importance of the structures they left behind. Now it's time to wrap this one up. The road less traveled isn't for everyone. We appreciate popular places, and we go to them, but we're special. We understand vastness and our place in it, at least partly because we go to remote places that are less than cushy, where man built civilizations at a time when his only tool was his own determination, and where there was a different type of nightlife. Please subscribe to my channel and share it with your like-minded friends, so together you can explore the road less traveled.